Hello, this is Chip Wilmot. I want to give you a uh, talk today about what to do when you're a newly diagnosed ataxia patient. It's a tough topic. It's a tough situation to be in, I know, but um, it's, it's important. Everybody who is diagnosed with ataxia, you know, goes through it. So um, I'm going to be talking in very general terms I'm not giving you like the, you know, super pro level tip that has super specific information because you're really going to have to find that uh, on your own. But the general outline of how to think about your new diagnosis, um, I think is important. And you're going to have to rely a bit on experts going forward who know you, you know, rather than me just giving a presentation. So let me go ahead and, and start. I um, don't really have any specific disclosures myself. Um, I do um, participate in some research and they're doing some trials and other things like that, but nothing relevant to this. So I think the most important thing when you start out is what have you been diagnosed with? What does this term newly diagnosed really mean? Because there's a lot of confusion about diagnosis with cerebellar ataxia. Many people will come in and say that I've been diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia or just ataxia or maybe cerebellar degeneration or cerebellar atrophy. Um, and that's because they've gotten an MRI, they've had some imbalance, maybe some slurred speech and their neurologist has di have diagnosed them with ataxia. Um, and that is great, that's fine, there's no problem with that. Um, but um, it isn't necessarily getting to what directly has caused that ataxia. And if we can get to that directly, that will give us more specific diagnosis. Um, the, other term that's sometimes used is another thing like idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia or cerebellar atrophy or cerebellar degeneration. We might even abbreviate that and call it like iloca or something like that. Now, I'm just throwing that up there as an um, example of a type of, at of an ataxia that, again, is a pretty nonspecific term. I use that term a lot in my patients. Who do I use it in? I use it in patients who I know have ataxia. They have cerebellar problems on the MRI and on their clinical exam. So they have cerebellar disease. And I do some investigations to find specific causes, maybe some genetic testing, maybe some blood work definitely some blood work. Um, and uh, they have a clinical picture with symptoms that don't clearly indicate one cause over another, and their blood work hasn't been revealing for one cause or over another. And I might call them idiopathic, which just means that's a fancy medical term that just means we don't know what's causing it. Um, and so this also is a pretty nonspecific term. Now, there might be a late-life degenerative ataxia, kind of like Parkinson's disease is uh, a late-life degenerative disease that affects your movement that isn't a cerebellar disease. But we don't really know exactly what causes that, but we can make that really specific diagnosis sometimes. Um, based on clinical findings and maybe some tests. And there could be a late onset cerebellar ataxia that we can never prove with a test that is similar in, in um, character to that Parkinson's disease. It's a very specific diagnosis, but it doesn't have um, a specific test that said what kind of ataxia it is. But there's also other ones that we will lump in this group because we don't have a test to throw them out of that group. Um, some people will 
instead of being called cerebellar ataxia, they might be called spinocerebellar ataxia. And spinocerebellar ataxia, in that case, would be another fairly general term. Really, spinocerebellar ataxia we like to use for autosomal dominant inherited diseases or genetic diseases that are inherited in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And sometimes we have a big family with ataxia in the family. We know that it's inherited um, in a dominant fashion, but we can't find what specific gene is causing it. It's not the common ones of SCA1, SCA2, SCA12, or anything like that. And um, those we might therefore most accurately call, called like an undefined spinocerebellar ataxia. But some people with no family history, instead of just being called cerebellar ataxia, might be called spinocerebellar ataxia with no further information. So this term is still not really specific unless it's got a number associated with it which indicates which gene is abnormal what, or what locus of the genome is abnormal and causing um, the problem. And then there are some very specific kinds of ataxia. Friedrich's ataxia. What is Friedrich's ataxia caused by? By a mutation in the Friedrich's ataxia gene, essentially. It's called something else, but... Um, the FRDA1 gene. So um, it's uh, a very specific disease. SCA12 would have a mutation in a gene that is a very specific thing. We're up to SCA48 now, somewhere in there. Big numbers. So there's lots of them, but most are types 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, Mikado Joseph disease is another name that's very specific, and that one actually is the same thing as SCA3. It just turns out that some people had followed patients with a disease and called it Mikado Joseph disease, and it turns out those were the same uh, gene mutations as SCA3. There are non, these were all inherited form because if you have an inherited form and you have a proven genetic abnormality, that defines the disease as well as we're going to in you. If you have a acquired form that is non-genetic, like multiple system atrophy, that one might, it, you know, multiple system atrophy has very specific features to it that allow us to diagnose without a positive you know, a test. We're not going to get a positive gene test in 99.999% in of cases or whatever. Um, we are going to be able to specifically diagnose that, though, because of the features of the disease. Or anti-GAD-associated ataxia. We're going to be pretty certain about that based on a blood test looking for glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies. So you have to go to your professional and recognize that the more specific you get, the more esoteric the information is. And um, you can get those diagnoses oftentimes by, say, a community neurologist. But if you're up here in the newly diagnosed ataxia, but without a real specific disease label that indicates exactly what subtype, you might have to seek out more expert um, physicians who specialize more in ataxia so they can decide what needs to be done to see if we can move you into that specific category. Not everybody is going to be moved into that specific category. I have lots of people that are still more in the general, even though I'm an expert in ataxia. Um, but a lot of patients come to me in the general category who I still move on to a more specific diagnosis category because of the things that I know about ataxia, the types of tests we can order, that type of thing. All right. 
I am not for some reason able to advance. There we go. So again, this is just general and this is more uh, specific. So when you get that diagnosis, we're gonna move on to just like what you do with the diagnosis once you get it, whatever, if it's a more general or specific, you gotta decide you know, how to approach that new diagnosis. And it's gonna be difficult. So you have to come to grips with it initially, and that can take some time. To help yourself decide on your path in the journey forward, you have to understand yourself. You have to understand if you're somebody who, you know, wants to always push hard for everything, or if you need to deal with it more internally, uh, do you are you more of an extrovert who needs the support from other people, or do you turn inward to yourself? Just being understanding of that. There are patients who know when they get this diagnosis, you know, um, i don't really want to go see experts every six months, you know, at a big medical center and travel and participate in research. Um, and that's okay. You know, uh, that, that is okay. So it's important to understand yourself. Some people really want to push hard for everything, become as involved as they can get. And that's a great thing too. The next thing you need to do is inform yourself and um, you know, I was going to pull off a picture of an ostrich with his head in the sand and um, have it on this uh, as a graphic, but it's something that we've all seen and, and know about. I don't think that's the best way to approach a new disease, but again, part of it depends on understanding yourself. If you inform yourself of what it means to have ataxia, I think you're more likely to handle the disease in a better way. Um, you can do the informing of yourself through so many different means. The fact that you're watching this means that you're already uh, interested in informing yourself, and that's great. There are other people who understand and know a lot about um, uh, the disease uh, in the community. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. Uh, next, you got to help yourself. How do you help yourself? Number one, recognize that this is, you know, a, a difficult to, disease to deal with it, but that doesn't mean that there's no help available. And you have to avail yourself of that by being strong and deciding that I'm going to um, ask for help when I need it. Um, I will do the things that I can modify. If there is no treatment for ataxia in terms of a magical pill that you can take that can make it go away, you know, for your specific subtype of ataxia, then um, that doesn't mean that there isn't help there. You can help yourself by being involved in physical therapy, by staying active, by taking care of your diabetes or other health conditions. Those things are critically important, critically important. Um, you can also give yourself, and I want to, um, you know, this is something where you need to, to take a lot of help, but sometimes it can be a cathartic and meaningful thing for you to see, to give also in a way that you might not be thinking of. And you do that by participating, you know, maybe in support groups or other things that involve other ataxia patients, sharing the knowledge, the tips and tricks about getting out of bed or whatever that you might have learned, the, the caretaker resources and everything else. Participating in research is giving of yourself. Um, and um, that I think can, be an important thing, not only for the community, but in terms of the way that it can help you to recognize that this is not simply something that you're a victim of, but it's something that is enveloping you that you can use to help others. And that makes the, the victimness of it, the victimhood of it, um, less uh, 
impactful. And I think that's important. Biggest thing is to live life. I use the example in my patients of, you know, most of the ataxia diagnoses, we don't, um, we don't have cures for yet. We're working on it. Um, but we, um, that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. And how you play your cards is so key. So you don't really get a reshuffle and to be dealt a different hand. You have the hand that you have. But that doesn't mean that those cards, if you're a bridge player, for instance, you know, those, there's a great way to play a bridge hand and there's a not so good way. And you got to learn to uh, and and to live life in a way that you're playing the, the hand the best way that you can. And um, people have challenges all in life. And, and it's important to do what you can um, to live around those challenges. Um, you need support. Everybody needs support, whether you have ataxia or not, but in the challenges of ataxia, you're gonna potentially need them more than some other folks. The support clearly comes from those closest to you first, and that is from family. Um, also comes from friends, um, and there are professionals, sometimes, you know, I'm friends with some of my, uh, with some of my patients, um, certainly, um, but the professionals that can provide guidance are not just your doctor, though they are important. They can give you a medicine to treat a new symptom, for instance. But also um, the professionals like a pastor, um, if you're religious, um, being able to turn in that direction can be very uh, helpful. Um, there's social groups, staying active and everything gets, a, gets more difficult with mobility impairments and difficulties. But it's people, you know, still want to be around you. <laughs> um, and it's still good for you to be around them. And, you know, a lot of it depends on the stage of disease that you're at and what exactly is going on. And, of course, this is what's been so tough with COVID. Uh, it's a really hard time right now. But still trying to maintain connection is absolutely critical. Of course, the specific social groups to ataxia our support groups in the National Ataxia Foundation. Um, and that's a key resource um, that you should avail yourself of if at all possible. Now that we're all using Zoom, you know, people can get together and, and um, use creative ways to maintain connections, uh, even when it's more difficult to do so in person. But when it can be done in person, that's a great thing to do as well. Um, and the last thing I wanna say really is, um, Consider the value of research in ataxia um, because, um, you know, we all have to deal with this diagnosis. Um, as patients, you're dealing with a, a new diagnosis and um, there's going to be somebody next year who's dealing with a new diagnosis of ataxia. So um, you can move us all along in the journey towards having that happen less and less or be less impactful when it does happen. By being a subject of research yourself, we do natural history studies where we follow patients over time. We do some treatment trials where we're trying out a new treatment. There's lots of ataxias for which there aren't a lot of research studies right now for, but, um, we're all thinking about trying to do more and we want to be able to do more. And you can promote research by speaking about it, um, by um, doing fundraising and other things, uh, by supporting the NAF, who is a great proponent and supporter of research. And um, that's a, ultimately gonna be a great answer for a lot of us. So those are the things that I um, really um, just wanted to bring up in a little formal talk, I'm going to be answering questions. Um, and this is the way I see kind of the attitude and the approach to take when you're new, newly diagnosed. Know what you're really diagnosed with, decide on how to approach that, whether it might need to be pushed a little bit harder through experts and, and, and et cetera. Um, inform yourself, help yourself, give of yourself, and um, use the support mechanisms that are available to you, and then consider 
um, the value of research so that we're all dealing in the future with less newly diagnosed ataxia patients. Thank you. All right, Dr. Willemot, I have some questions for you. I'll start with my questions. And if you, um, for all those out there, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A <laughs> section of um, the platform, of the Zoom. All right, so my first question I have for you is, if I get a positive result to Canvas from the testing, is the chance I have Canvas extremely likely? If you do, if you are positive for Canvas testing, yep, is the chance that I have Canvas extremely likely? Yes, it's um, essentially a hundred percent. There's always issues, and with Canvas, for those who don't know, Canvas is cerebellar ataxia with neuropathy and vestibular areflexia. So you have inner ear problems, and you have nerve problems in your legs so you don't sense have sensation as much and you can get cerebellar degeneration too. So all these things can lead to um, balance problems. Actually, it can be pretty slowly progressive and isn't always that severe, which is kind of remarkable given all those systems that are affected. Um, and it does have some reduced penetrance, meaning some people will have um, really mild symptoms, maybe so much they don't notice it. And if you have a positive gene test, it's a recessive disease. So if your parents were carriers, they might have given it to you, yet you might not begin with symptoms until you're age 45 or 50 or 55 even. So it, it tends to be a later onset recessive disease. And so it is possible to have a gene test without expressing the symptoms of the disease. Um, but um, it's still, most people who have the positive gene test will end up at some point anyway, developing some symptoms related to that, though there's enough variability in how severe those are, they might be extremely mild, almost not noticeable. Thank you. Another question here from Jody. What are the stages of ataxia? I keep hearing early onset, late onset, and late stage. What does late stage mean? Those are just English words. I mean, you can define them when you're doing a research study and there's a commonly used thing with six stages. Basically, the first stage is no symptoms at all. Next stage is just a little bit of um, things that uh, symptoms that don't interfere at all with function. You don't need to use any kind of a gate aid, et cetera. Stage six would be confined to a wheelchair, unable to ambulate at all on your own, you know, even with a walker, that type of thing. Um, there's other stages that have been done where stage six is death you know, and um, so it's really five stages. And then there, we in medicine often use kind of a threefold severity ranking, mild, moderate, severe, early, mid, late. Why three? It's just nice and convenient. What really defines it though is going to vary. And unless it's directly laid out by a protocol and a research thing, there's a lot of slop in the system. So don't get too hung up on that. When I say a patient is late stage, in general, I would think of them as being in a wheelchair, uh, maybe even difficult, maybe able to use a walker a little bit, but need somebody to be walking with them because they might fall otherwise. Maybe can ambulate some with a walker without somebody right there. Um, but it kind of depends on, on the diseases and what is being affected. Um, like in Friedrichs, where you can have cardiac problems and scoliosis and weakness, the um, parts of the manifestations of the disease might be late stage, like 
your legs are so weak you can't even transfer on your own at all. You need a Hoyer lift or something. Whereas your speech might be okay, and maybe you'd think of that as mid stage or something. So it's a little it's a little bit um, undefined. Don't get too wrapped up in it. I would say. Uh, next question, can a 16 year old teen with SCA2 be a part of a clinical study where the minimum age is 18? Can we get a waiver to participate? In general, no. Um, the protocol inclusions and exclusions for clinical trials um, are quite rigorous and they must be adhered to for the validity of the study. Um, there is something that happens when you're 18, you can give consent on your own. When you're younger, there's something called assent, you know, where you're not legally able to give your own consent, but you should still verbalize that you are agreeing to the study and then you can have a legal guardian, you know, um, sign for you. Things like that are sometimes done when it is okay to enroll somebody who's younger. But um, if there is a trial that specifically states, you know, the ages are 18 to 72 in 33 days. If you're 72 in 34 days, you almost never can join that study. It, it just has to be that way. Um, you know, you can certainly always ask that specific trial sponsor and all that, but um, generally speaking, no, that won't work. Okay. Um, here's a question I get often at. Uh, an AF as well. This one has to do with SCA2, but it'd be for probably all ataxia. Um, what is the life expectancy in SCA2 early onset and what can we do to extend a healthy lawn life? Life expecting is a expectancy is a really tough thing. Um, you know, what's the life expectancy of another disease that can be pretty severe like ALS? Well, it's short for ALS, totally unrelated <laughs> to ataxias essentially. But um, I use that example because generally we think of it three to five years with ALS. And yet we all know the example of Stephen Hawking who couldn't move, who was on a ventilator and lived for decades like that. Um, so when there isn't something that is affecting your heart, or your kidneys or liver or something like that to literally take you out at some point, then life expectancy is going to be dependent on things that are a little bit random. Like, did you fall down and get hospitalized for that and then acquire a hospitalized hospital-based infection, which are harder to treat, you know, or something like that. Um, so it's hard to talk about life expectancy. Um, in general, earlier onset people have more severe disease that might progress a little bit more rapidly and have a shortened lifespan. Um, so, um, you know, there might be, if you look at everybody who has SCA2, let's say that was diagnosed with symptoms you know, the age of 20 or earlier, or 25 and earlier, you know, life expectancy as defined by studying all those patients and then seeing when they have died might be 10 to 20 years. That's a totally rough guess. Um, there will be people who live longer than that and some unfortunate people who will live, live shorter than that. Um, but it's hard to predict because it's a little bit just random when you get something that is deadly, like a bad infection or a bad result of a trauma or something. Um, the, those, you know, things that you do to prevent infections are really important because infections, when somebody is debilitated in a, in a wheelchair, you're at higher risk for pressure sores. And, you know, in hospital medicine, people 
particularly elderly, but die of pressure sores all the time. Um, that happens. So those are important. People die of pneumonia, you know, regardless of ataxia, you know, people definitely die of pneumonia a lot. And in, with ataxia, with swallowing problems, you're at higher risk for developing pneumonia because the, the, the uh, bacteria from your oral cavity are more likely to get down into the lungs. So um, things that you can do, um, stay on top of swallowing studies. Uh, if you need to thicken liquids and things like that, it's a good idea to do that, to reduce the risk of aspiration. Um, no matter what, even if you put in a tracheostomy or if you put in a feeding tube or something like that, you still do not eliminate the risk of an aspiration pneumonia that could potentially be deadly. Um, try to not fall. <laughs> um, not only can that just hurt, but it can lead to um, you know, worsened um, chances of picking up a, a life-threatening problem. Um, and, um, so the staying active, being careful, the really just common sense things are the most important things to do. Focus mostly along infection prevention and, um, trauma prevention from falls or, or other kinds of unfortunate events. I had one patient didn't really fall, but she tipped over, she was in a power wheelchair, she tipped over and essentially the, the, the chair um, crushed her um, enough that it, that it killed her. So there are um, things like that that are semi-avoidable, but not, not 100%. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, have you ever encountered a case of cerebellar ataxia that was caused by mono, mono monoclonal antibody drugs? That is drug Right. Yes, absolutely. There are, um, our, you know, the medical field in the last 10 to 15 years has come out with so many advanced medicines, particularly for the treatment of cancer and autoimmune diseases. And some of th this is the type of thing that um, sometimes those medicines are what's called biologicals. They're not just an oral pill that you take that has an effect um, by interacting with a receptor in your body or something, but they're actually antibodies or protein fragments. And those biologicals can be very powerful and wonderful drugs, but they can also have a little higher risk of side effects. So there are classes of cells of, of agents that have ataxia as a side effect. Um, the um, um, checkpoint inhibitors are a class of um, drugs, for instance, that um, are used in cancer that have a definite risk of, of ataxia. Um, some of the other um, monoclonal antibodies that are used um, do as well. Um, I, you know, can't sit here and tell you the names of all of them, but when we see a case and somebody's on that, we're always looking into, could this be responsible? And it does explain some of the cases, um, um, but by, thankfully these agents often are given without any significant problems neurologically and, uh, and they can do a lot of good, but sometimes they, they do cause ataxia, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going back to Canvas here. Is there enough research known about canvas to have an idea of its progression for those of us who do have significant symptoms? Um, there's a lot of interest in canvas right now. Um, it's kind of a, you know, the, the favorite child of, uh, uh, of ataxia in some ways uh, in that a lot of people who did not have a family history and had late onset um, have now been found to have canvas. Um, even when the sensation and the vestibular symptoms were fairly mild. Um, there, 
the, the research that's going on, um, there's a good bit from Europe. Um, and there is a study that is starting um, that they're um, that's at many different centers and many of us have been contacted about it and um, it's it's mostly a um, trying to do get better natural history data on cannabis we want to understand um, how the disease evolves exactly what the symptoms are are there predictors of um, uh, how somebody will do, you know, the severity, like I said, can vary a good bit and, and what predicts that and that type of thing. So uh, NAF is probably aware of that study and you can contact you know, them about further info. Um, and um, so that's the, that's one of the, the most recent effort to really gather more clinical information. And then there's isolated people around the world who kind of has been interested in it um, for quite a while before the gene mutation was found um, and have done some um, neuropathology and things along those lines. Um, and I'm sure that some of that work is, is continuing. I don't know all of those details uh, of that more, a little bit more basic science stuff though, I should say. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question for you. How do you monitor the progression of ataxia in your patients? Theoretically, um, we would do a SARA scale, which is um, the scale for the assessment and rating of ataxia or a similar scale to try to judge how somebody is doing. Um, it's essentially a clinical exam that has some numbers attached and has been proven to be reproducible and that type of thing. Um, in a busy clinic, when you're running an hour behind, which if any of you are patients of mine, you will know I do quite frequently, um, I'm not always going to do a full SARA on every single patient that, you know, has a little bit of ataxia. I'll do it on the patients that I'm following for a study, um, certainly. Um, and I will do it in a lot of uh, my clinic patients, but not absolutely everybody. But you can, you can judge um, how people are doing just by the clinical exam and by talking to them. And most patients for most neurodegenerative ataxias um, don't worsen super quickly, um, thankfully. Um, these tend to evolve over many years, not many months, although there are like autoimmune ataxias or side effects of medicines that certainly can present uh, much more quickly than that and evolve more quickly than that. But for the neurodegenerative ataxias, which is probably the majority of what we see, it's slowly progressive. And usually a patient can tell you, you know, last time I saw you, which was let's say six months ago, I'm a little worse. And they can sometimes tell you a little bit about what has functionally changed. You know, um, I'm having to use a cane now all the time instead of sporadically before. Um, we can also take other scales in addition to the SARA scale, um, like uh, functional kind of measures. Um, these are done in research settings, tend to be too in-depth and take too much time to be a routine part of most clinical care, um, but they could be used um, and they could be uh, potentially very helpful. Um, so there's a number of both instrumented ways, and by that I just mean maybe questions or exam. I don't mean things that are poking and prodding you necessarily, um, that can give us a measure of the severity of the symptoms at that point. And, but even without that, we do get some sense, and I would say most people progress identifiably in about six months to one year. So if I see mild patients once a year, um, I'm often going to say, you know, there's going to be a little bit of progression over that year, but it's usually not going to be real major. And just, you know, typically would see patients every six months, maybe every year. Um, 
depending on whether new medicines are being started, where in which case it'd be sooner than that. But that's based on that measurement of progression, that if you're the same as when I saw you last, you don't have any new problems, do I, you know, you don't really need to be seeing me then. We need to be dealing with what needs to be addressed now. And that's often a new symptom or a progression of a past symptom. So a six month follow-up period usually works pretty well. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't want to call off, but then, all right, sorry. We have time for one more question, I think. We have four minutes. Um, does SCA affect cognition or memory? Uh, absolutely can affect more cognition than, than memory. Um, so Jeremy Schmaman um, at Harvard has done a lot of work on this, as have some other researchers because the cerebellum is hooked up to the thinking parts of the brain in addition to the moving parts of the brain. The cerebellum kind of modifies other stuff. That's kind of how it works. And um, most of us think of cerebellar problems as having motor effects. You get uncoordinated, you get ataxic, slurred speech. But in fact, that's because of problems in part of the cerebellum, but a good part of the rest of the cerebellum, in fact, even a larger part of the cerebellum is hooked up to other areas of your brain that don't have a motor function and they do cognition. So when you study patients who have cerebellar pro, uh, disease and you look at their cognition, it turns out that executive functioning um, meaning um, um, decision-making, following kind of complex thinking, logic patterns, um, generation of new ideas tends to be more of a problem than actual rote memory. If you have somebody who has a very focused memory problem, who also has cerebellar problems, you might think that maybe they have something else in addition to their cerebellar problem, like Alzheimer's disease or something like that, because the cerebellar disease doesn't do a lot directly to memory when you test memory directly. The problem is that in order to remember things, I mean, I forget things all the time. We all do. And that can be exacerbated if you're distracted. So like, Poor sleep can cause memory problems. Medications can cause memory problems. Pain can cause memory problems, but it's not a primary memory problem. It's these other things affecting. So people with cerebellar ataxia, either through their kind of executive concentration problems or through other things like pain, depression, uh, poor sleep, things like that might have some memory problems as part of their cognitive thing, but it's usually not the main primary problem. It's more of this um, thinking concentration problem. And the way to think about that is it's an ataxia of thought. You know, um, it's just harder to focus in and stay like doing a finger to nose is very precise. An ataxic finger to nose is not so precise. And that same type of thing can happen a little bit to thought as well. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Vilmot, for joining us today and answering questions. Just a reminder that we do have a newly diagnosed uh, networking session this afternoon. I hope to see you all there. And Dr. Vilmot, do you have any parting words that you want to No, I just, <laughs> all I wanted to say is, um, the uh, National Ataxia Foundation does a great job of kind of integrating the newly diagnosed and getting your feet on the ground. It's a complex field that gets very confusing to a lot of people. So, you know, rely on the resources that are available to you, and I think it'll make things easier. Well, thank you very much.